to talk about pH that's uh, not uh, a very common topic. Um, do I need to do a uh, speaker thing? Because I'm ah. not very loud. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, I think without even beginning to, t to talk, I can already hear the little voice in the audience saying, does pH really matter? Uh, who wants to care about pH? So here's an example that pH actually matters, and this is a very classical um, binding study con um, conducted by uh, Alan Furch's lab um, decades ago. Uh, what's shown here is um, a protein, a classical enzyme known as bound star, um, bound, uh, binding with uh, bar star, so protein peptide binding. And uh, you can see here um, the K off value is hugely dependent on pH, and in fact, from pH 5 to pH 7, uh, the kinetics, so this uh, reaction speed, increased by 100 fold. And you can also uh, see that, um, consequently, the Ki value is changing by uh, 2.7 kcal per mole by this uh, decrease in the in off rate. So, uh, so that's the illustration of pH effect, right? But many people would say, but I don't care about pH. So here's an example that uh, doesn't say anything about pH because all we want to do is we want to study the binding on um, free energy uh, of the system. Um, and we're asking question, what is the binding free energy at uh, pH 7? That's what most of you are interested in. And it turns out, uh, in this case, histidine 102 changes its protonation state upon binding. And therefore, by not accounting for this change in protonation state, the error would be 2.7 kcal per mole, which is really large. So does this happen often in protein ligand binding? And my answer is yes. I actually, if you look at many, many systems, shown here <coughs> as an example, HIV Proteus, um, it's got uh, aspartic uh, residues looking at each other in the active site. And upon um, um, ligand binding, um, depends on type of ligands, uh, the diet residues uh, can change their protonation state, uh, and the ligand itself can also change the protonation state. And today I'm going to talk about the difficult case. We're going to have uh, variable protonation states for the protein, but also the ligand. But first, let's look at some classical examples. Another system very well studies, and there are so many papers published on this well-behaved system. And now for, uh, for this uh, um, uh, trypsin binding problem, um, the ligand is very rigid, right? Um, we know that uh, the aspartic acid 139, uh, 189 uh, forms a salt bridge with the diamine group on the ligand. And as all we know as a chemist, uh, salt bridge means uh, ion, ion, ionization state is favored towards the charge state. And therefore, everybody is running this with charge state in their apo state, right? But not, not many people realize that, in fact, in apo state, in the unbound state, this particle acid residue can be actually unprotonated, so neutral. So that would actually introduce a very large error. However, we don't actually see that error in the literature, and I have an answer for you later in the talk. And I just want to throw it out there and see whether one of you guys can figure this out. Why do we not see this error, although formally there is a quite large error due to one pK unit shift? So what we really want to do is to run simulation at a constant pH, not only at constant temperature and pressure. So supposedly we are interested in pH 7, and we run a simulation of a protein um, wiggling in, uh, in the water box, and showing here are two histidine residues. And as we all know, the pK of histidine is close to 7 in, in solution, and therefore um, very likely they're going to change their protonation states, right? So they're going to fluctuate between charged and neutral states. So that's the reality. Um, that's what we call the constant pH molecular dynamics. Now, currently, there are two types of approaches, uh, pr approaches to, to incorporate pH effect in our MD simulation. The one type is based on the Monte Carlo scheme, which uh, incorporates both molecular dynamics and the Monte Carlo sampling of protonation state. And if we do this long enough uh, in, in cycles, then we eventually converge both conformational state and protonation state. The advantage is that we have physical states here. We have proton on or off, zero or one binary problem. So that's why we give this name uh, a discrete constant pH method. And now there's another uh, class of approaches uh, 
based on lambda dynamics approach uh, that was developed um, more than two decades ago in Charlie's, Charlie Group Brooks lab. Uh, this is known as the uh, continuous constant PHMD. And the name continuous comes from the fact that now we include a variable called lambda, which can continuously vary between 0 and 1, representing the two end protonation states. And currently, this is the most validated approach. And I also claim that it gives the most accurate PK values. Um, and it has very low computational cost because we don't need to run the millions of Monte Carlo steps in between. And rather, we're going to propagate a set of uh, lambda variables that are on the order of the titratable sites, right? There are not many of them in the system. And we're going to calculate those forces for propagating lambda values using the lambda dynamic approach. And, and therefore, we are only adding really a tiny bit of uh, uh, decrease of freedom into the calculation. So that's why the computational cost is, is low. And moreover, the convergence is very fast. We can deal with uh, multiple titratable sites titrating at the same time in a similar pH range. Uh, we have uh, really a problem of converging them. And the only drawback currently that, that I can see is we do have unphysical intermediate states. So what it means that in order to facilitate the transition between the protonated and deprotonated states, we have to go through the intermediate lambda values. And those intermediate lambda values correspond to unphysical states, right? But there are ways to suppress them. So currently, we're using a uh, simple harmonic potential to suppress the population of those intermediate states. And normally, we keep them under 20% uh, in our si simulations. And nonetheless, we need them in order to facilitate the transition. So um, currently, um, continuous constant PHMD has been validated on, uh, in many, many systems. So I'm showing you here uh, the most recent example is to show how, to, how useful uh, is to get very accurate PK values and site-specific PK values. So this is a very well-known problem in uh, enzymology. Uh, proteins uh, who perform function as acid base, acid base catalysis. And we have here two uh, acidic residues, and one of them acts as base, the other one acts as an acid. And if we can run uh, PK calculations, then the PK value difference will tell us uh, which one is acid, which one's base, right? The PK value that's lower uh, correspond to the base, the higher one correspond to the acid. And we did this exercise using other uh, methodologies out there, Parson Boltzmann solver. Um, empirical PK predictions, and none of them can give us the predictive answer. And this is because it turns out the catalytic site um, has these two uh, residues that have equal number of hydrogen bonds, and they also have uh, the equal exposure to solvent. So there is no distinguish distinction between them. How do we dis distinguish their PK values? And it turns out if we run the constant pHMD, we can correctly predict the acid and base. And this is because we now incorporate the dynamics with the protonation state changes. I, by doing that, we also reveal that the nucleophile is, in fact, more stabilized by the number of hydrogen bonds in a pH dependent manner. That's what lowers the pK values for the base. And with constant pH MD, we can now ask questions about what's the mechanism of a large conformational transition driven by the pH change. So shown here an example of how we can study a phase transition between um, a bilayer and, and, and surfactant micelle using constant pHMD. And we can also study the self-assembly problem in a pH-dependent manner. And finally, many people are interested in how um, transporters and channels are driven by the <coughs> pH gradient across the membrane. And we can now begin to, uh, to understand the problem. Um, and uh, in a straightforward manner, we can directly sample the large conformation transition between the closed state and open state, just use by using constant pHMD. But today, I'm going to focus on the theme of this symposium, which is to incorporate how to incorporate pH into the uh, binding free energy calculations. So I'm going to use the example of beta secretase, which is an enzyme involved in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we're going to look at the dynamics of base 1, as well as the off-targets, uh, catapsin D and base 2 which are very similar looking. And oh, we're going to uh, ask questions about their interactions with the inhibitor. So what is base 1? 
Base 1 cleaves the Alzheimer's precursor protein from the beta site. Together with the gamma secretase cleaving from the transmembrane site, we generate the beta amyloid peptide, which goes on to aggregate, forming fibrils and eventually plaques that are implicated in the disease. So many, many uh, small molecule inhibitors have been uh, uh, developed over the last two decades. And a dozen of them ha have entered the clinical trial, but none of them has uh, been approved. I think there's a lot of industry people out there who can testify that uh, it's a challenging problem. Perhaps uh, that's the end of the uh, Alzheimer's uh, uh, amyloid uh, hypothesis. But nonetheless, there are two candidates that are still under clinical trial. The uh, AstraZeneca one uh, is going to uh, run until uh, 2021. Another one from Merck, which we were very excited about last spring, but didn't get approval because there was no effect for mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease patients. Uh, but now, nonetheless, the trial is still, still ongoing for early stage patients until 2019. Um, today, I'm going to show you a compound closely related to the Eli Lilly compound shown here that was actually discontinued due to toxicity issue. All right, so let's take a look at the structure of base one. So there are two uh, important features of base one enzyme. First of all, it has this very long beta herpin <coughs> loop that, covers, that can cover the active site. It turns out at room temperature, it can move. Um, and then there's this active site that contains two aspartic residues that are looking at each other. One of them is acting as a base, the other one acts as an acid. So what do we know experimentally? We know that the enzyme, since it resides in endosome, um, is most active at about pH 4.5 or pH 5 in that range. And uh, the activity decreases very sharply below 3.5 or above 5.5. Uh, there was also binding data uh, uh, um, collected in a pH dependent manner, which showed that uh, as pH decreases, the binding affinity increases. Now this is done for the peptidomimetic compound. All right, so much do we know about the system experimentally. Now we're going to do the constant PHMD simulations. So here's the system. We have a, a protease containing about 400 residues. Uh, we're going to, just for this academic exercise, we're going to um, um, titrate all the aspartic residues as glutamic residues as well as histidines. And for, in practice, for industrial application, we do not need to do that, right? It's just for us to exercise. And we also have an inhibitor. Um, we're going to titrate one side on, on the inhibitor. I will show you in a little bit which side. But let's first take a look at APO state, the dynamics of phase one. What can we learn from it, although publications were out there already a decade ago? It turns out the flap actually moves in a pH-dependent manner. Um, at low pH and high pH, the side is actually closed, shown here in this free energy by this free energy minimum, which means that the flap has a very short distance to the one of the aspartates. Okay? And moreover, a hydrogen bond can form. Once that's down, then the site is closed. Um, by contrast, in the, in the enzyme active pH range, uh, the flap is actually open, shown here in these, uh, two, uh, by these two free energy minima. And oftentimes, there's a hydrogen bond between these two side chains. I think the experimentally, uh, a lot of people are in, knew this. Um, interestingly, when the uh, inhibitor comes in, it's locked in one single state. So that's interesting. That shows us it's a conformational selection mechanism. So as a summary, what we learned, we learned that the flap moves in a pH-dependent manner. Um, in the intermediate pH, uh, the binding competent state um, is uh, mostly, is largely popul populated, and conversely, the, the closed state, the um, tyrosine inhibitor state, um, is least populated. So that's base one. Now let's bring on the off-target Ctapsin D, which is very similar in the structure. They are like twins, right? You cannot distinguish them. But if you look at the dynamics, it turns out this flap is rigid, and you now shown here in dashed lines. So it's always in the flap position, it's always in the binding competent state. How wonderful, right? Um, all right, so let's look at their binding mode with the inhibitor Lily compound. And as you can see here from this plot, um, the binding mode is identical. We have the uh, aspartyl binding motif, 
consisting of these two amine groups um, forming hydrogen bond, uh, uh, charged hydrogen bond <coughs> slash sawbridge with the two uh, asparto diet residues. And on the other side of the inhibitor, we have a pyramid ring, which can form a hydrogen bond with the uh, threonine group in S3 pocket. And we're going to uh, titrate this nitrogen here because uh, we have, based on our chemical intuition, although the pK is low, meaning it's deprotonated, it doesn't have a proton in solution. Uh, upon inserting to an uh, uh, environment of protein, it may become protonated. So we're going to titrate this, this side. Uh, we're going to fix the other side because that side forms a very strong salt bridge with the, uh, uh, with the uh, as aspartic residue. And it has a pKa value already at 8.7 in solution. So it's going to be shifted higher, so it's not relevant for our studies. It's going to be always charged. So basically, there are these three uh, very important interactions that uh, binds uh, the protein and the ligand. So now we're going to discuss how we're going to um, take on this problem is incorporating pH into the binding free energy calculations. So there are two ways to do these calculations. The first method is just to co incorporate our constant pH MD into the conventional free energy simulations. And I think this approach uh, has the potential for the future. Uh, these are the reasons. We have a convergence difficulty issue because if we run a constant pH MD and the histine wants to be in both protonation state, you can imagine uh, the lambda, each lambda window would sample both protonation state, you have a convergence difficulty. You have to run the simulation very, very long. And you may also have a pH induced conformational change. Your starting structure is at one pH and you're going to run at a different pH. You're going to have a conformational change there that prolongs your simulation. And secondly, error coming from the um, FEP calculation may be compounded with the uh, calculation from the constant pH due to protonation state inaccuracy. And finally, uh, right now it's kind of expensive because we're going to have to combine the FEP windows with number of pH replicas that we, we need to use. All right, so what is the other approach? The, uh, the simple and, 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 and cheap approach that I'm going to propose to you now is to simply run a conventional FEP calculation at a reference pH, and then we're going to add a, uh, a free energy correction based on two sets of pK values, the APO state and the hollow state. By doing this, we can rely on the standard protocol that you guys already presented, how accurate it is. And uh, we know that errors can be separated, right? So if we have make mistake or have errors on one side, we know what's the error bar, and then we can also have error bars for our pK calculations. And we can also get additional useful information for inhibitor design, which I will show you in a little bit. Now, only caveat here is that you need to actually have very accurate pK tool that give you both precision and, and accuracy. In fact, this approach was proposed already decades, decades ago. And um, many, several groups already use that to, to study proton ligand binding problem and how that can be uh, affected by the pH effect. And turns out, if we use the Poisson Boltzmann method, for instance, and look at the APO state and the hollow state uh, pK values, they can be very much different. And this is because there's lots of noise there. Um, the approaches that based on single um, conformational state or no, single crystal structure, uh, structure um, they are very sensitive to slight difference in, in, in the conformation um, state. And the pKs, as a result, are very much different. In reality, upon binding, there are only a few residues that are going to change their protonation state or their pK values. So how do we do this using two sets of pK values uh, to get the correction? And it turns out we already have a classical tool in hand, which is known as the Wyman linkage equation, which tells us your binding free energy change with respect to uh, solution pH change is proportional to the difference between the APO and the hollow state net charge. This is a very simple equation, right? And you can do a simple integration of this uh, net charge change along the pH axis, and you can get that uh, uh, pH correction, uh, uh, free energy correction. Um, this was done many, many years ago, so this is a classical example. By first slap, they uh, just measured what's the uh, 
delta q and integrate this curve to get uh, what's a delta, delta g, right? Very simple. And now we can also do another way, and namely we don't need to measure the net charge. That's not very, uh, we can do that, but another way of doing this is to look at the pK values, right? Once we know the pK values, we know what is the net charge of the system. So we can um, uh, analytically derive this equation, and now you can see instead of the net charge difference between the two states, we have the pK change between the two states. pK of the hollow state and pKs of the apple state. Apple means uh, unbound, hollow means bound. And now we know that if a residue that can produce a pK shift upon binding, that residue is going to contribute to our free energy change, delta, delta G here. And this is a very simple equation here that tells you the maximum contribution from that kind of residue that shifts its pKa upon binding is going to be 2.3 RT times the pKa shift. 2.3 RT is 1.3, right? RT is 0.6. And you can quickly see 1.3 times 1. So if you have a 1 pKa unit shift, that's going to give you an error about 1.3 kcal per mole. Okay? And if you have two unit shift, you're going to you know, double that, right? All right, so far about the basics. And now we're going to run this exercise on our base one and Kthapsen D problem. Uh, we're going to perform the absolute free energy calculation using double decoupling scheme uh, for both base one and Kthapsen D. And what we got was nearly identical values. So the binding free energy is about minus 12.1 or minus 12.2. So they're identical within the error bar. Not surprising because they are very similar looking. And now we're going to run the pK calculations or run the constant pH to figure out pKs of both states and uh, figure out what are the contributions from each residues. And uh, this is the plot showing you what are the pK shifts. And it turns out most of them have very small pK shifts below 0 0.2. That's our error margin uh, for the calculation. And there are only really two residues that stick out in the, in, in, in the pH range of our interest, and namely from uh, 4 to 7 or 8. Our reference pH is 8. One of them is histidine 45, which changes its pKa value by about one unit, actually 0 0.9 to be more exact. And uh, what it does is actually stabilizing as pH is decreasing. Right? Another thing I wanted to mention is that not only you need to have the pKa shift, but also you need to have the pKa values residing in the interested pH range. So suppose we have also very large, like on this low end of pH value, you have residues that contribute a lot, right? Those pKs are very low, and they're shifting to even lower values. They don't matter because we're not interested in pH too, right? So not surprisingly, histidine contributes because the pKa is very close to 7 to begin with, so 6, six or 7. All right, so now we're going to look at Catapsin D. For Catapsin D, we also have only a handful of residues that contribute. And the largest contributor is, not surprisingly, the, actually the, the inhibitor Lily compound on the <laughs> pyramid in ring site. Um, there is a pK shift uh, of about 1.8 uh, pH units. Oh no, this, this is 3.7 to 4.9, so it's 1.2 pH unit. And for the catalytic side, uh, aspartase, the pK shift is even larger, but it's not very relevant because it's in the lower pH range. Uh, if you add them together, it turns out they all cancel, right? So that's the, uh, the life, right? Lots of error cancellations and a lot of process minuses. And so what leads to our, the total free energy uh, pH dependence? For the Tapsin D, because of the cancellation between the positive contribution and negative contribution, we end up with a very flat curve. So there is literally no pH dependence. Um, and for uh, uh, base one, however, we have a, a stabilizing contribution from histidine, which brings our uh, uh, free energy down. And the difference at experimentally measured IC50 pH value is about 1.3, and compare to the experimental value. Now, this could be very um, incidental, right? It's not a, a proof because we haven't done a huge number of systems. It's just a proof concept study. But nonetheless, it's uh, providing us very, with very interesting insight, which I will show you in the next slide. 
namely what happened to this histidine, right? The histidine is a large contributor. You would think it's very close to the uh, binding site or directly contacting the inhibitor. This is how a normal mechanism is for a PKA shift. However, if you look at the structure, the histidine 45 resides on a loop which is next to the 113S loop that can contact uh, the inhibitor. It turns out when histidine 45 titrate, it can move from solvent <coughs> to uh, getting inside to contact the phenylalanine 109, which then in turn perturbs the interaction between isoleucine 1110 and the inhibitor. So this is how it does the job of stabilizing um, the, the binding at low pH. At low pH, it's swung out to the solution. It doesn't contact uh, phenylalanine, so the binding is not perturbed. When it's neutral, it contacts the, the phenylalanine, um, distorting the binding site. So we have a proton coupled allostery there. What's the time now? Oh, okay. So it's 20. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm down. So this is 25 minutes or 30? 25. So oh, okay. 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 So this is a little summary for the phase one steps in D study. Um, so in the context of this meeting, we have learned that the two proteins, even though they have their structure is very similar, they have identical binding modes. They have different pH profiles for the flap dynamics <coughs> and binding free energy. Uh, for base one, um, the histidine 45 uh, protonation really allosterically. Um, perturbs the stability of the binding at low pH. And for capsin D, even though we see uh, very large contributions, those contributions um, offset each other uh, and resulting in the flat pH profile. Uh, what we also learned that the ligand can change its, its protonation state. I show you there's a one unit pKa change. So now if we look at a larger uh, 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 set of data going to another off-target base two, this is really the cousin of base one, right? Um, it turns out the PK shift is even larger. In the same direction, its PK shift is 3.7. Uh, the PK shift is 2.7, but if we translate that into the delta, delta G is 3.7 kK per mole, which really tells us how important um, it is to account for the change in the protonation state. Um, just, just to tease uh, the audience, so why does it happen, right? So it turns out um, when um, the pyrimidine ring is, is charged or protonated, um, a direct hydrogen bond can be formed between the theronine and, and the site. However, when it's deprotonated, which is what we run in the normal simulation, you have a water bridge hydrogen bond between uh, serine and the same pyrimidine site. So you see water molecules bridging the two sites. And all this happens in a pH modulated manner, and they actually offset each other. Right? When it's protonated, you have hydrogen, direct hydrogen bond. When it's deprotonated, you have the water mediated hydrogen bond, uh, which then gives us the hydrophobic effect. All right, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge the people who performed the, the work. Um, Chris Ellis was the uh, postdoc who uh, worked on the base one and cadapsin systems who's now a staff member with FDA. And Kevin is, uh, is a, a graduate student who did a fantastic job continuing work on Catapsin uh, D and Base 1 system. And Robert uh, Harris performed the free energy calculations. And Jack Henderson is a PhD student who uh, works on uh, Base 2 system. Um, I want to show you the answer, the answer for the question that I posed earlier. Why did we not see an error for the uh, classical uh, Tripson uh, benz amidine calculation. So I told you there's a PK shift <laughs> effect there, right? So if you translate that into the free energy change, the error is about 2 kcal per mole. That's very large, uh, considering the, the, the binding free energy is only about 6 kcal per mole. And why <coughs> did we not see that? It turns out, uh, for Tokitis late, our interested state is actually pH 8. At pH 8, none of this really matters. <laughs> Um, so here's the answer. So we assume that it's pH 7. That's how I got the correction. But it turns out the experiment was conducted at pH 8.2. At that condition, the condition state does not change. Okay. All right. So thank you very much. <laughs> Put it out there. Any quick questions for Yana?
transmitting a lot of binding affinities, which we see a lot, um, by just using the permutation state that's assigned to the complex. Do you have any appreciation for how widespread this phenomena might be and how important that might be? I would love to you know, collaborate with someone who has a you know, large data set for us to look at. Maybe uh, Robert <laughs> can, from sharing a site, we can get some data and look at um, systematically how much are we up due to the protonation state change. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank Yana again. One final speaker before the break, which is uh, Chris Bailey uh, from